Maximum denial, minimal belief. Today on Good Morning Trumptopia, a special segment of the almost daily Zencast. Brought to you by SeaTac Studios. Hello and namaste, friends, audience, and virtual family. It is Wednesday. Wednesday? Wednesday. The day of wed. Uh, it's hump day, December 30th, 2020. 11.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'm your new favorite talk radio style podcast host, and this is the fastest growing amateur podcast on the planet, or at least we aspire to be. Thanks for being part of this community. So, what is the great orange chosen one up to in his final days of his lame duck session of his singular term in office with only 22 days left to run amok? Trump is keeping it classy, running amok, and golfing throughout the entire Christmas holiday, while millions of Americans suffer in multiple ways, all of them directly caused by how dear old Donald Trump and his administration of fools, yes-men, and sycophants have handled the pandemic response. He is literally not bothering to actually do the job in a meaningful, tactful way that renders good results for the plurality of the American people. A job that he is pretending so hard to fight for. Pretending so vividly to... Have you ever noticed he has those moments where he just looks like, I'm so exhausted, but I don't give a fuck. And, like, all of the pretense goes away from his face, and he's just like, hmm, whatever. You ever notice those moments? I think those are very telling. I think that the fan base, I guess that the following statement could be made of both the fan base and those of us who oppose him. The, the way in which we interpret his body language and his facial expressions is obviously biased in the direction in which we seek to analyze him. Right? The base is going to interpret everything as some sort of savvy, smarky, winky, winky, nudge, nudge, say no more, say no more. Like clues that let you in that you're in on whatever grand master plan this seven dimensional chess king is supposedly playing. The rest of us look at his clown face and be like, he's trying to be funny to an audience of few that he thinks thinks are in, in on the joke. It's the cynical way I see it. And he's trying to keep it, like, blank and easily projected upon for everybody else, I think. And I think it's one of the things he's really good at. Uh, welcome to the show, and good morning to you. And if you're like me, uh, it really does kind of boggle the mind that he that he does this, that he pays so much lip service to pretending to want to fight for this job and fight for the American people when he's clearly not. When he's, he, like, for example, I don't know that he created the meme. I don't know that Trump issued or ordered the, the photoshopping of the meme, but I know that he retweeted it. There's that image that looks like a giant royal self-portrait that merges Trump's face with a with a like boxer body, which I think is overtly either a, um, a Rocky pose um, 
Or it's, I don't know, but the pose is weird and distinctive and it feels like they've, they, like they're quoting it, like they're copying it. Like someone took the, an actual image of another boxer, a famous boxer, and, and made it look like it could conceivably be the, the toned muscular version of the orange tanned, uh, temporary king who imagines himself to be strong and powerful. But the truth of the matter is, the man's a slob. The man's a big, fat, gelatinous, McDonald's burger-eating slob whose most active physical activity is walking from one place to another and yelling at reporters or ignoring them um, and golfing. Like, that's the most... And I don't mean to detract from golfing or from golfers... I get it. It's a physically active activity. A day of golf is exhausting. I know. I've played the game. I'm horrible at it. I'm not going to pretend to be otherwise. Do I? And I am not going to pretend to have a burning urge or some deep-seated respect for it either as a game. It's just a silly thing we made up. Fun, interesting, real-life factoid about me. This is not literary reference. This is not fiction made up for the, the cosplay of it. I, the actual real-life performance artist behind this crazy show you're listening to, have stood in Edinburgh, Scotland, on the self-declared, self-identified, earliest known golf course, maintained and manicured, strictly speaking for the purposes of playing rounds of golf with beer and pub food, by an authentic, genuine, ancient, yieldy time Scottish pub. I don't know if they use a different word. I just always called it a pub. I was only there for a month. And while I did feel completely immersed, I, I also felt like it was a lot of the local slang was flying right over my head. But I digress. That trip also involved me going to one of the greatest bars I've ever had the glorious uh, honor of stepping into. Not that I glorify alcohol uh, the way it can be glorified sometimes, but that's a whole messy issue. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. I've already talked about it on the show, I'll talk about it again. I had the the genius fun, let's put it that way, of walking into a bar that was entirely um, the dude themed, as in the dude from The, the Big Lebowski. That was a treat. That was that was quite a, a highlight of, of, of that, that trip. Um, but golfing, golfing. More golfing than Obama did. And he's only been there for four years. Right? I think I might be stretching it a little bit, but he's on par to like way surpass Obama. Like if he would have stayed for eight years, I think he would have doubled down on the golfing next term. Just saying. It's purely speculative. I could be wrong. But based on my understanding, my some 20, almost 30 years plus of, of being aware of him as a public figure... Because my objectionable sort of like adorable love hate, I'm going to criticize this guy because he's putting himself out there to, you know, to be a public figure and he's openly seeking admiration and he doesn't seem all that worthy of my admiration. I take giving my admiration to something or someone a little bit seriously. Not too seriously, right? Because I'm also, I myself am a clown. I'm an absurdist, self-ridiculing, like, I want people to laugh at me on stage, but that's a whole other subject. Um, put a pin in that. I will have to come back to talk about it in depth because it is central to like the psychology of the art I want to be doing, which is not exactly what I'm doing in this show. Um, but it, the show is an ingredient or a step towards that. So keep that in mind uh, and be mind boggled by it. Uh, hopefully that's not as mind-boggling as Trump golfing for the entire Christmas holiday. Meanwhile, 3,000-plus um, American people a day, maybe more, uh, maybe less, depending on whose argument about how wrong the counting is you agree with, um, are dying from this disease, which may or may not be just a gnarlier version of the flu, or may or may not be nanobots designed to eat our brains away from the inside or whatever it is. Um, here we are together again for the very first time confronted with this ongoing dilemma 
and and the sort of madness of the way in which Trump and his administration and his loyalist his his like various tiers of loyalist sycophants um because it is truly evolved beyond just just a sort of an innocent political cult of personality it's now a very toxic and i think ultimately self undermining self destructive cult of personality uh the the operation that trump is running the op- the maneuvers that trump i would speculative speculatively argue the, the maneuvers he's actually contemplating are about how to like bail himself out of the 400 million plus dollars of foreign debt he's you know facing as soon as he walks out of the office and and the lawsuits and the criminal investigations that will uh you know haunt him for many a year uh once he gets out of office and you know it, it what he's left us with is a a socio-cultural political environment where a really large portion of the population although not the majority tragically they believe themselves to be the the ignored and neglected majority but i don't think that they are i think that right now um the duopoly has carved out what is ostensibly only sort of like to one third to maybe if 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 I'm you know uh underestimating and it's really larger than it is two thirds of the american like eligible electorate right and then there's everybody else who are still americans by virtue of living here in america which is supposed to be an inclusionist melting pot not an isolationist segregationist elitist judgmental um self divisive <laughs> driven by radicalization and extremism in, in both ends of the duopolistic uh paradigm right wow that was a mouthful forgive me folks um and now to give you time to process and to stick with the advice that my friend helped me put into a uh, a recent acquaintance of mine helped me put it into uh clearer terms for myself. I always knew that, you know, I needed to get, make the show a little less wonky. Uh and uh a recent acquaintance who, who indulged in sampling some episodes for me and giving me feedback, which is much appreciated by the way. Feedback's always appreciated from everybody. Said, "Make it tighter, make it more concise." Um sort of like pick up the pace, don't talk more, don't talk faster, like change up the rhythm in which the show works and it clicked so my deepest thanks to that social media friend for helping me kind of like refine my own understanding and now i hand it over to dj z with a new track from his forthcoming imaginary album end times the deeper the better a dubstep 101 remix live track for your listening pleasure
And welcome back, folks. My humble thanks for your audience participation. Here on this show, I try to avoid bias traps. I try to avoid everything that I discuss and share from having a now, having looked at and, and, wow, I'm having a hard time with the word analyzed. There we go. Having looked at and analyzed everything, all sides of the cacophonous argument. There is a cacophony of noise and raging arguments going every which way about what's going on in the world. For every particular idea, subject, or theme, there's this kind of mind-melting plethora of often contradicting conflicted theories. But I always stop and, and ask in terms of my own analysis, right? We're talking about COVID and what's been going on in the history, the, the you know, where we are right now at the end of 2020 uh, and, you know, how it's developed throughout. Uh, if you're new and just joining the show, you'll see that I've made um, various episodes that sort of try to drill down into interesting questions or aspects of the pandemic and um, the response to the pandemic and how it's been unfolding um, in real time, right? Because the show was up and running and I was trying to do it a little bit more often than I had in previous years. And now as we move into 2021, where I literally want to do it every day as my daily, like my commute to work is is got to be from the kitchen where my coffee maker and where I'm trying to transition to tea by the way, if you pray, everybody pray for me. I really need a quick coffee. It's reached a point where like my body's telling me like stop, right? Even worse than cigarettes back when I was trying to quit smoking, um, which I think I may be, by the way, for those full disclosure, I am a chronic, like I quit for a while and then I pick it back up again, almost unconsciously, um, uh, smoker of cigarettes. And yeah, it is what it is. And it's horrible, right? Like it gives me insight though into the duality of opposing something while consuming something that is either worse than the thing I oppose um, or equal to or as bad or the very thing. Like, I oppose smoking. Like, I don't think kids should pick it up. You know, I, I used to literally um, uh, work for an agency that would do, uh, you know, education for, uh, for young people uh, about smoking in order to hopefully... Um, informed them enough that they would avoid sort of casually falling into it. Uh, and I testified, like, as an addict, as someone who's like, I'm hooked. I digress. I digress. I digress. On this show, I try to look at... That was a whole thing, right? Um, welcome to the show. My brain is always busy hyperanalyzing three different things at once. And sometimes when things converge and there's nexuses, I go off on tangents. And then I'm usually okay kind of, like, figuring out my way back. And here it is. We're back. I try to approach the with things like this. Let's zoom in on back on COVID, right? There's a lot going on with it as an issue. There's a lot of arguments going on. But what's the common divide? There are those who are taking it seriously enough to be part of a coalition of people who take it seriously at different levels some who fear it, some who don't, some who doubt it, some who believe in it a little bit too much. And then everybody else who sort of is thinking in the opposite direction and is, and they are a, a coalition of people who have various reasons or have attached themselves to various different conspiracy theories. But then, you know, there's a bunch of people there who, who oppose it without needing a conspiracy theory, right? They're just, you know, this is a, this is overreach, um, even if it is real, right? Um, and so I try to take that, that range of ideas seriously enough to ask myself the following questions whenever I try to derive to conclusions or you know, try to come to my own assessment. If it's real, like what if, if it's real? Like what if it's real, what does that mean? What implications, what, what logical plausible, realistic, based on my weird, quirky, um, mystical yet organic 
uh, worldview and interpretation of, of the universe and how it apparently functions, what does that mean? What conclusions do I come to? What do I think I should do? What would I suggest others consider, etc.? And what if it's not real? What if it's fake? What if it's actually really totally a hoax? Because we, we seem to be living through a social, a period of social discord that's, that's caught up in that question, despite whatever else is going on. Uh, and it's certainly a, a, a big, big, giant theme for 2020, something that will probably be discussed, you know, and there'll be meme wars about, and will be uh, retroactively referenced as either proof or or evidence in in either direction of, of you know uh, conspiracy theory or the opposite. What do you call non conspiracy theory worldview explanations or rationalizations of the world? And there there must be or there will be eventually a label, right? Like okay, taking a moment to pivot to. Uh, worldometers.info forward slash coronavirus. Um, they are a free, uh, apparently award winning, unbiased data um, st- statistic ana- analysis um, sort of reporting crunching site. Uh, go check them out for yourself. Do your own due diligence. I've talked before about why I think I can sort of give general credence to these numbers um, because they're not, A, first of all, they make no claim to be like the hard, absolute, bottom line, um, hardcore facts. They're very clear that these are like data-driven models of the most accurate statistical estimate of what is most likely to be the number based on multiple sources of data, including Johns Hopkins and um, whatever the name of that hospital in China is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So go check it out. As as with anything, don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. People send me links for sources of stuff all the time. And it's really interesting because they're saying like, it's absolute hardcore proof and evidence. And I really giggle when I, you know, go to click through to them and they are things that are, that don't even exist or that have been taken down or whatever. I don't know what that means that they've been taken down. Is that the truth being... Is that, is that, you know, postmodern digital book burning or is that they're taken down because it's verifiably debunked and nonsense and an obvious source of misleading information? I don't have the resources to backlog and back check everything that's ever been taken off the internet to find out, right? If I did, I would run that study. I would get a team to statistically analyze that kind of stuff. But I digress. That's a whole other thing. Let's come back to this coronavirus situation and these numbers. According to worldometers.info forward slash coronavirus, and as of yesterday, please note, if you go visit the site for your own perusing, uh, regardless of the time of day, and right now it's 1130-ish Pacific Standard Time, I always click on the yesterday tab because I want to know the whole number for a complete day. Right, And if you're on the now tab, this is their rolling estimate, statistically driven, you know, statistical analysis uh, a driven estimate for the current possible number. So, you know, again, disclaimers have been made. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, the most sensible thing to do is really to compare multiple sources and multiple numbers and arrive at your own conclusions about what the most likely actual number is. Uh, considering all the variables and caveats and, and possibilities on either direction of the various you know, arguments that it, the number is off somehow. Because there's arguments that the number is off in a downward direction. In other words, they're inflating it and there's, there's not as many people dying as they claim there are. Or the number's off in that it's being undercounted um, through through various, you know, flaws or faults of the system and, and or, you know, uh, unforeseeable circumstances. 
But as of yesterday, to get to the actual discussion of the numbers as presented, um, in the U.S. of A., right, which is the single nation state in the world, whatever shape it is, put a pin in that on the board for new listeners, um, it's the single most... Mm, what's the word I'm trying to say? What's the phrase I'm trying to state? The USA, or Trumptopia, as I lovingly call it, because I do believe that it currently exists in like a dualistic state. There is, There are the people who live in the United States of America, and then there are people who live in Trumptopia. But that's a whole other discussion, right? Like how we create the societal systems of the world that we self-identify with in our minds and the, and the real-life impacts that they have. Put a pin in that, too. In the one country where the issue of risk reduction, mitigation measures, prevention, and, and the whole everything, the umbrella bundle of things under quote-unquote bending the curve or preventing the spread or reducing the spread has been flaunted, debated over, and actively neglected and ignored by the largest you know, per capita portion of the population out of every other country. 3,398, well on its way to almost, you know, halfway to 4,000 4, a day. Um, 3,398 people died yesterday. And of course, there's all the raging arguments about how that number is flawed or invalid for all kinds of interesting reasons. But if you're a true critical thinker, you don't just latch on to one argument and critically think against everyone else who disagrees. You attempt to critically analyze both sides to, to reduce it down to that catchphrase of any single issue. So, if it's real, what does it mean that 3,398 people died yesterday? Right? If it's fake, what does it mean that they're claiming that, they're, that that is so? And what are the what are the ways in which, you know, what fallout might we expect under both questions? Having said, and I'm not going to bore you through the walkthrough on that. I'm just saying, because I don't want to dictate to anyone what to think, right? This is my opinion show, and I share with you my opinion and my conclusions. And then I say, don't take my word for it. Go critically analyze it for yourself. But don't ignore these things, these questions, these, you know, add these questions to your process and seek out other questions too. Let me take a moment in today's episode to talk about some of the thoughts I've been having about what if it's real. What if it's real? 3,398. Well, obviously this is one number out of a year's worth of data. If it's real, one could reasonably expect to see organic exponential growth based on human behavior in the trend line. Check that box mark. Roger that. That's exactly what we see. We see a clearly verified through repetition lag time frame, like a delayed time frame of um, like vectoring infection, places and times and events where people are exposed to others who are carrying and shedding viral load through a period where the individual exposed who was previously hitherto um, presumably never been exposed is now a carrier is also asymptomatic for a range of four days to two and a half weeks, according to some estimates, a fortnight, from four days to a fortnight, you could be carrying the virus mildly to virulently infectious and not necessarily expressing many symptoms or any symptoms at all. And then you enter, you know, 
you see this organic pattern, right? And it was identified like, we think this is the way it's going to work. And over time, that has been the way in which all of the statistical numbers, total new cases uh, per day, uh, total new deaths per day, and the growth of overall total cases and total deaths globally and nationally, it has behaved in a sort of fractal organic way in response to our modification to behavior. In countries where they took risk reduction measures more seriously, they bent the curve more directly and have maintained lower rates of infection relative to countries where they didn't. Trumptopia being prime example number one of, a, of an open, ongoing experiment in convincing one large, but, you know, one large pl plurality, which I believe is a, a, an accurate technical term to use in this situation, but not majority, chunk of the population to either completely deny that it is real and, and radically ignore all, all um, preventative risk reduction measures, or at least, you know, be wavering and get bored enough of it all, you know, exhausted enough by it all to, to let their guard down, etc. In order to maximize uh, that, that infection rate and, and, and in, encourage the spread Right. And this, if it is real, one would expect a measurable, repeatable, verifiable, organic cycle of infecting, uh, building a viral load, shedding a viral, uh, uh, you know, new viral expressions. So, you know, sp spreading the particles out there in order to, you know, make contact with others. Um, and, and that, that confluence of individual human behavior and the congregate effect of group human behavior. So you get this element of, you know, mild spreader events and super spreader events um, and the virus responding to that by repeating the cycle, which then has this lag period in which you may or may not develop symptomology and then boom, right? Like the measured new cases per day, typically to the best of my understanding of how it's being reported, especially in Trumptopia is a measurement of people who tested positive for the, uh, you know, you know, the virus. And most of the people being tested are uh, increasingly though This is shifting, right? More and more people are, te are being tested preemptively, but still because of the milieu, because of the pop cultural phenomena of the debate itself, people overall on all sides are kind of were lax and sort of hesitant and, or, you know, refusing to get tested. People to this day continue to refuse to get tested and spread that that message. Um, so most people who get tested and identified as a case are people who are like getting sick. In other words, not not getting infected and having a viral load, but finally expressing symptomology that is above and beyond that mild level, which people often sort of rationalize, misassociate, or identify wrongly as other things and then sort of play down or dismiss. It isn't until it broaches a certain threshold, right? And gets kind of really obnoxious. And I've heard from people who have it personally. So, and that, and that swear to me, it's not the flu. It feels different. It, the waves of pain and discomfort, the phenomenological experience of it from when the onset of the sort of early symptomology through to the worst, like, oh my God, I thought I was going to die moment. This is people who I know personally who, who relate to it and who were lucky and blessed enough to not move on to the intubation phase, right? Because there's two phases of the expression of the symptomology. If it's real, this has been measured and defined by people living through the experience and witnesses of it in the hospital system reporting on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Have we had a huge, full, complete scientific and analytical study of all the actual case studies yet? Of course not. Are we even really doing that appropriately? I don't think so. Because as I've said from day one, 
the singular feature of the global political response to this has been rooted in ignorance, incompetence, corruption, and a willingness to fuck about with it and a denial of how seriously to take it. If it's real, we should take it pretty seriously. I have a whole different set of thoughts about whether or not, uh, what, you know, how to respond and, and, and along the same notion of what I was just expressing, responding to the question of if it's fake, uh, which I'm happy to share with you. But first, uh, I will play with you another music track to stick with the manifesting of my friend's suggestion. And then we'll wrap it up for today because I'm trying to keep the shows down to a certain length. DJ Z, uh, take it away from one of your albums. I think I've played this song before on the show. Forgive me for the repetition. Underlying principles understood. I think it's from the early years. It gets cut off because the title is long. And this is a chill step two remix live track for your earballs. Thank you. 
Delightful. Welcome back, friends and audience. Um, to put a bow in the question, or put a button on the question, kind of wrap that up, uh, uh, what if it's real? Uh, if it's real, we need to brace ourselves, because things are only going to exponentially get worse as the vaccine rollout is, I think, maliciously fumbled and bumbled and clusterfucked to be not as promised, but as slow as possible. Trump himself said he was supposed to have gotten 20 million doses in people's arms by now. We we're barely breaking 2 million Americans actually vaccinated. Mind you, friends, for any new listeners who are going to jump to conclusions, I'm not a, bland, a blind faith pro-vaxxer. I'm not a blind faith anything. So, but put a pin in that. We'll come back and talk about it more. Uh, I want to talk about like, okay, what if it's fake? What if it's a hoax? What if it's totally a democratic socialist tyranny hoax designed to make us live in fear and kowtow and bow down to police state, da da blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. If it's fake and that is the case and that's what's going on, why are so many GOP right-leaning Trump-supporting Republican politicians catching it and dying from it? I mean, I guess the only response there is to make it believable, I suppose. I, I, I don't know. Um, if it's a hoax, if it's totally fake, why are there so many personal, private, like real life, not private, real life um, uh, testimonials on social media, like on YouTube and Twitter, etc., of folks who were formerly real-life COVID deniers, aggressively mocking and ridiculing everyone who was worried about COVID and insisting that they knew for certain that it was completely fakes and totally a hoax designed by the tyrannical, socialist, nefarious, evil left extremists that are out to destroy this country, quote. And then they got sick. And then they rush to the hospital and they live through the experience of what it's like to have the symptoms of caused by this particular virus. And, and, and they've said it out there. This is not a hoax. This is not fake. This is not just the flu. It feels completely different. It fucks you up in a completely different way. Why did Luke Letlow just die at 41? Was the evil nefarious cult trying to kill him for some reason? Right? Like, the problem with the the whole culture of denial of you know the denialist movement is that their rationales, while plausible sounding, are tragically sort of easily rebunked. Right? Like, there's a lot of new content right now trying to undermine. Um, the issue and the concern of the, quote, new variant, which is being reported as being, quote, more virulent, if not less deadly, than other variants of the, the virus. Um, and, but what most of this new contact, content, you know, this COVID denial content, um, which is designed around undermining and dismissing this whole like, this whole reporting around the new variant is missing out on or is completely sort of neglecting, purposefully ignoring, is they're pinning it, they're making it sound as if it's new and that the evil nefarious perpetuators of the of the COVID hoax just made it up in response to Trump's heroic unleashing of the vaccine, which makes no sense because technically most of those people used to be anti-vaxxers or a big chunk of the Trump base are anti-vaxxers. And so it sort of it just sort of causes chaotic conflict there. But the fact of the matter is that this new variant was literally reported on back in September. I talked about it. I've got a show entitled It Mutated. It has mutated, actually, according to reports, um, at least four times. Curiously, one of the variants made it possible for the virus to uh, transmit and infect a s one certain specific animal, minks, 
for some reason. You know, the, the fur coat and, uh, creature that everyone sort of fights and argues about. They are kind of adorable, and it's really weird and interesting that suddenly now they're getting COVID due, apparently, because of one weird, curious, sidebar uh, uh, mutation variant. Here's the thing. If this is fake, these reported out variants don't make sense. Right? If this is a hoax or some, you know, zoom out and, and, and go over and take a look at uh, Pick a Lane, my episode where I really sort of like drill down into the, the problem of how much conspiracy theory content, what a diverse array of conspiracy theory content that doesn't agree, that doesn't all agree with itself, there is. Because it creates a sort of a logic dilemma, right? They can't all be true. But they all claim absolute truth. If this is fake, then the actual reported out pattern doesn't make sense. It would be behaving differently in my humble opinion. If this is real, these mutations kind of do make sense. A disease that needs living organisms as host bodies to exist and perpetuate itself on, and that as in as it exists already causes damage that uh, you know if it's if the if the you know particular virus is successful enough that damage becomes so widespread that it kills the host it would evolve to sort of counterbalance that a little bit because you know and it makes sense it's got this 4 days to a fortnight long period where it can chill in the host body and just use it as a factory to make thousands of babies that then go out into the world and find other host bodies, right? That that's what, by definition, viruses use, uh, you know, um, us for. They colonize us, be used as a platform to procreate and consume and procreate and consume resources. The resources being you know, the little chunks and bits of our cells that they, that they eat up to, to, in order to generate them, you know, the, the new copies of themselves. If viruses could live in our bodies, procreate and spread and reproduce and not cause damage to the cells that they occupy, <laughs> what a different world this would be. But wow, I don't know where that question came from. Which, you know, it's got nothing, that's neither here nor there when it comes to the issue of is it real or is it fake. Um, if it's real, these, uh, these, these four iterations and, you know, more iterations make sense. Not necessarily some of the fear-mongering content coming from the opposite direction about how to be really, really freaked out about this mutation, necessarily. Uh, but the mutation itself, especially this most recent one, the one we're call, calling commonly the British variant or the English variant it's already out everywhere it was just reported if I'm if I'm understanding correctly um, out in Colorado although technically we're supposed to be screening and or preventing travelers from Britain coming over here I've been of the opinion on the it when I put on the hat of if it's real and I think about it I have been for a long time now of the opinion that our reporting of it has an other sort of epic, big top level meta lag and that we've been aware of it in del in a sort of delayed time frame right that even the earliest reports were technically late and that the thing we call covid-19 had already been out about in the world and spreading and building towards evolutionary ad adaptation because everything that's alive and if, and you know it, it for Anyone out there that disagrees with the with this, you know, following statement, forgive me, but your disagreement is yours to have. You you have the free will to have it. But my best understanding of the world after thirty years of paying attention went uh, paying attention to it, and you know, trying to de separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, and in this analogy, I mean the the valid information that has been confirmed and verified through re repetitive you know, multi-source observation and measurement and, and, and analysis, and that which has been 
built on exaggeration and or fabrication and or and exaggeration and that strays from the observable reality for some innocent or potentially corrupt reason because you got those that's the wheat from the chaff right um in the in my particular use of it so i come to the conclusion having observed you know based you know based on my whole lifetime of experience and and the things that I think I can stand by uh, as like, those are functionally real. Whatever argument is going on about it, it's, it's a real thing, <laughs> you know? Um, I, and I, I cannot agree with all of the various, sometimes irrationally different, um, you know, the whole, the big spectrum, the cornucopia of denial arguments. I just can't. Because I know people who've gone through the experience. I myself was like, redonkulously sick this time last year just before all the reporting broke open about it. And if my own theory is correct, it's not impossible that I had it. Um, was I able to get tested at the time? Of course not. None of it had broken. No one had heard of, no one outside of the scientific realm that studies the entire family of viruses that we commonly call coronaviruses had heard of COVID-19. Although it had already been discovered and there had already been some stuff, you know, some tracking of it and some attempt to begin to understand it. In you know, I was sick as a dog basically from a little bit before Christmas, through Christmas, and into New Year's. And it came, and I, my experience was of multiple waves. At the time, uh, not knowing, not having heard of, not not there being no cultural acknowledgement of COVID nineteen, I really was sort of like, wow, this is the gnarliest flu I've ever experienced, and I deeply suspected the reason for that, based on you know my own understanding and my own um, conclusions about disease and how it works, that it must be some interesting, curious subvariant of the flu that my family, my extended family members who came to visit must have brought with them in an asymptomatic state because I'm really well aware of that and has existed long before COVID-19. That is not some statement or idea that was made up for this hoax, which is a chink in the armor of all, all conspiracy theory because that's how they cast it, right? In order to cast out. Now, mind you, pause for a moment, dear friends and listeners, especially for anybody really new listening to the show. I am not in denial that there is a system of oppression. I talk about it, dig deep into my shows. And I do not categorically reject all conspiracy theory content. That would be pretty absolutist and qualify as throwing the baby out with the bathwater. My whole perspective is sort of diff you know, different in this way. What I bring to the table is no one should blind faith believe all conspiracy theory content the way no one should blind faith believe any organized religion, right? No offense to organized religion believers. I think that there's something deeper going on um, that we need to push through and, and, and rediscover and reunite around. But that's a whole nother episode. And I've talked about it in other, you know, in past episodes as well. Um, so... To come back full circle, it's fascinating that they're, you know, the the take it seriously side is really fear mongering it and is not going too much trouble, into too much trouble. It's not doing a whole heck of a lot to explain the variant, right? And when they do, it's because they're trying to be, you know, maintain their authenticity and their, and their, and their what's the word, their prestige as, you know, as responsible, transparent journalists. And that's fine. That's fair. But they're also sort of like leaning on the fear, like, oh my God, this new variant, this new variant is spreading. And of course, you know, to various degrees, they do it kind of gentle. Um, and some places do it kind of hard. But the new variant ain't that new, just like and, and this is one of those things that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow from a bunch of you know, people that are all over the place on this, on the, on the graph of where your worldview is. Um, 
you know, this variant of the coronavirus is not new the way the New World Order isn't new. <laughs> but that's a whole other discussion. Put a pin on that. I was just having that talk again for the umpteenth time with someone on social media recently, and it tickles me pink. Uh, but I'm sure I'll, I'll come back around and talk about it again. If it's fake, then one has to wonder, why do prominent people in... in in politics, keep getting it and dying, getting sick with it and dying. What what's really going on if it's fake, right? Are they assassinating people? <laughs> That's a bit intense and scary and wild and crazy. Um, but if it's fake, why don't any of the conspiracy theories actually pan out as reasonable explanations for what's going on? And why do they have enough flaws to be able to discredit them? I mean, if I can, if I can take the time to look at conspiracy theory claims and and not preemptively judge them as insane, right? Because I don't. People accuse me of that all the time, but I don't. I have been impartially observing conspiracy theory for 30 years. And I get it. There are aspects of truth in a lot of conspiracy theories. It's a broad spectrum territory, right? The landscape there. Under everything at all that you could call conspiracy theory content ranges from completely made up and totally not true to really, really close to the actual truth, but also being used to manipulate you and not leading you to any real conclusions that are actually helpful. So sort of kind of meaningless, rendered meaningless, because no matter how much, how no matter how close to the truth any particular conspiracy theory might get or have, you know, what, no matter what percentage of truthiness it might contain in its content, its overarching um, flaw is that it's being used to manipulate you in a way that is misleading and does not uh, achieve the Great Awakening, does not bring you to a place where you spiritually heal yourself and start facilitating the healing of the species, plural apostrophe, um, deep down, long neglected spiritual trauma that we're all collectively being called to address and simultaneously being distracted away from, right? Because even some of the truthiest of the conspiracy theory content out there has that critical flaw that the conclusions rendered point to violence, not spiritual healing. And to me, that disqualifies them, even if they've got a lot of truth in their content. And that's where I'm at. And that's where I make my stand. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. And you keep coming back for some interesting reason. And it isn't because I'm so crazy that I'm wrong, right? Um, no one's paying me to say this shit, folks. Uh, a lot of people sort of get a little flavor of one of my statements and the knee-jerk response that I must be a shill for the socialist left. I'm like, that's the furthest thing from the truth. The only government checks I've ever gotten have been income tax returns from all, you know, from both types of presidencies um, and stimulus checks from Donald Trump. Uh, no one else, besides you, dear friends, listeners, and supporters, is in any way, shape, or form paying me. Uh, in other words, the only financial gain I get from this show is the fact that it is monetized. So your attention is becoming my income, Right? And if you appreciate, even if you disagree with me, if you appreciate that I bring these kinds of questions to the public discourse, uh, keep listening to future episodes and dig deep and listen to past episodes. Uh, but the, my point in saying this is that, like, I'm not a paid shill, right? I'm trying to build my own brand, trying to bring my own product to the public discourse market and to the fan, you know, to the fiction market which is a whole, it's like a sidebar project that's related, but not immediately, you know, it's like there's also a bit of a gap of separation, right? Um, at any rate, uh, so my sincerity, my sincerity, my, my, my opinion is wholly my own. And it is rooted in, in my sincere and authentic life journey and the sort of deep thinking thoughts that have, you know, come out of that. Uh, and my concern for my you know, the rest of humanity, my fellow occupants of this place slash living platform of life, 
we commonly call planet dirt. Um, so much more to talk about, friends, uh, including but not limited to that article from those two psychologists uh, referenced. Lost. Hold on a second. Burr, 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 burr. Um, there's an article floating around. I think it's at the Washington Post under the opinions section. But uh, I bring it up not because anyone's paying me to advertise that particular media outlet, but because the content seemed interesting um, from having, you know, just sort of gotten a teaser for it myself uh, on another platform where they were discussing it. And I want to take a look and take a deep dive and talk about it from my own perspective, too. Um, there's an article out there entitled, quote, Our Divided Times or An Opportunity for Empathy. Really? Uh, and that's a big uh, melting pot of issues and discussion topics there in and of itself. I would add to that, like, I would agree, agree yes, these two psychologists and their opinion article as published, I generally and feel inclined, based on the title, to think I might agree with their overall argument. And that's that we should take this opportunity to utilize empathy. As opposed to all of that conflict which the duopoly echo chamber, hashtag two wings, one bird, are, you know, struggling to lead us down towards, which is ultimately rendering violence. Having said that out loud, dear friends, I will leave you with a final bit of music. Flights of Fancy, DJ Zed, Come Fly Away, Groove Pad Remix.
Either way, folks, if it's real and organic, or if it's some sort of hoax that involves a real thing that's killing people, we have to brace ourselves because the exponential growth will not show a downward trend in my humble estimation, in my modestly informed amateur guess, we're not going to see an overall downward trend of the ongoing exponential growth of this thing, whatever it is, until earliest mid-February. Maybe even March or April. If Trump might be accidentally right about something, is that whatever this thing is that we call COVID-19, it might not start to go away, quote unquote, until April of 2021. Which will then will still be a kind of arduous fight because between now and then, the wedge issue that is being used to manipulate everyone in the country will continue to thrive.